Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Michael. So I'll be talking to you about uh, Dr. Amlu's uh, trial that was actually recently published, Optimum Blood Pressure uh, in Patients with Shock After Acute MI and Cardiac Arrest. It was published in Jack, and uh, thank you all for joining. Um, so I'm a cardiologist intensivist uh, right around the, the area of Montreal in the community. And just a little shout out to our team of a virtual journal club committee. Uh, so it's myself, Dr. Goldfarb, Dr. Rainer Hartley, who's writing her uh, ICU boards today, and Dr. Andy Fagan, which I think is here. Um, I have no conflicts of interest. So basically, um, the background behind the study is that we know that mortality in patients with shock after myocardial infarction is high. It's still approximately 50%, and really little has been done to change that. Um, in the recommendations, uh, in order to manage these patients with shock, uh, the ACC and AHA recommend using inotropes and vasopressors. That's also not based on very high quality data, but even less data is with regards to the MAP targets. Um, and we know that the optimal level of pharmacological support remains unknown, and we're obviously always balancing risk between two things. On one hand, too much pressors are, or can, can, um, can worsen arrhythmias, and but too, blood pressure that's too low can worsen myocardial oxygen consumption, cause increase the size of MI, and perhaps by giving pressors we could offset those effects. So there's a balance in play that we still don't know what's the best way to individualize it and cater it to our population. So this study is a post hoc analysis based on two previous uh, trials that were published in the last two years that looked at similar questions. And it's important to kind of just go over them briefly in order to understand the trial. One of them is the NeuroProtect trial for which uh, Dr. Amalut was the first author. It was a pub published study in 2019 that looked at 112 out of hospital cardiac arrests that were shockable and non-shockable. And these patients were randomized for the first 36 hours to MAP65 versus MAP85 to 100. Um, the results showed for only 112 patients, obviously there was a higher MAP uh, in the higher MAP group, but there's also higher cerebral oxygenation and lower troponin levels. However, there's no difference in anoxic brain damage measured on MRI or neurological outcome. However, it was not powered for that. Um, the other published, the other study that they used was the ComaCare trial, which was a, a, a paper on 120 out of hospital cardiac arrest. And this paper only shockable rhythm, randomized to MAP 65 to 75 versus MAP 80 to 100 for the first 36 hours. There's no, uh, no difference in NSC, which is a marker of uh, uh, cerebral damage, and there's no difference in troponin levels either. So basically what this study did is that it was a post hoc pulled analysis of these two trials with the goal to assess whether MAP targets impact myocardial injury and arrhythmogenic risk in the subgroup of these out of hospital cardiac arrest patients with shock after acute myocardial infarction. They defined AMI as a STEMI or as a non-STEMI that went to the cath lab within two hours. So not just any trope rise with the non-specific EKG, the patient actually went to to angiogra angiography early. All patients receive standard of care in this pa in, including TTM 33 to 36 degrees. The primary endpoint was myocardial injury and it was assessed using an area under the curve of the 72 hour high sensitivity cardiac troponin curve obtained at multiple levels throughout the hospitalization. They did also look at secondary endpoints such as new onset AFib, re-arrest, cause mortality and cerebral performance category score at 108 days. So what are the results? So combined, these two trials had 235 patients. And, and when we exclude all the patients that did not meet inclusion criteria, we were left with 58 patients who were out of hospital cardiac arrest with shock post-MI assigned to a MAP 80, 85 to 100 versus 62 assigned to a MAP of 65. When we look at baseline uh, characteristics, I'll pay your attention to this box on the on the right because this is the patient, the groups once they were randomized in this post hoc analysis. We have a mean age of 62.5, 87% male, a time to ROSC of 21 minutes, 90% uh, were shockable, so this is a very significant portion, and similar TTM targets in both groups, but noteworthy that 87% of patients had TTM of 33. Um, the cause of the arrest was a STEMI in more than 80% of patients. All patients received immediate angiography. In, these, in this population, the most likely culprit was an LAD, 
Um, more than 50%, 52 to 65% had single vessel disease, 60% achieved complete revascularization, and 90% had a post-PCI TME flow grade three of 90%. Uh, sorry, a grade three in 90% of people. When we look at the results, um, there was higher, obviously we expected that, higher MAP targets in the therapy that received higher MAP targets, higher diastolic blood pressure, which is important because that's what, that's what drives coronary perfusion pressure, higher levels of uh, pressors of norepi in the group uh, that were targeted higher MAPs, and heart rate, there was no significant difference uh, despite higher levels of pressors. When we look at the primary endpoint, there was a significant difference in terms of the area under the curve. That's a surrogate for myocardial injury. Uh, it met significance at a p-value of 0 0.04. There was no difference in terms of secondary, of predefined secondary endpoints, such as new onset AFib, recurrent cardiac arrest, CPC 1 to 2, so good neurological outcome, and all-cause mortality at 180 days. When we look at the forest plot, breaking down separate subgroup analyses, there really wasn't any major trend towards one group or another, um, a bit down the middle, but also this, there's not so many patients, we can't expect to have such power in these subgroup analyses. So what are the limitations that the author, authors mentioned? They did say, well, it is a combined post-hoc analysis. This is in an RCT looking at this question strictly in this population. There is a possibility of bias by unknown confounders. Uh, it's a, we use a, they use a surrogate to, to assess myocardial injury, where CMR is the gold standard for myocardial injury. And also the surrogate for myocardial injury is not necessarily a surrogate for uh, a survival or for neurological recovery either. There's no long-term LVF assessment. And most patients were at TTM 33. And, we, and hypothermia may actually attenuate the risk of arrhythmia, so perhaps that played a role. So we're gonna, well, this will lead to the discussion, but I remember that I actually did discuss this with Dr. Kamloot in the past. I completely forgot about this, but we had this exchange over Twitter. Um, and uh, it's funny that this led to this journal club a few weeks later. So I would invite you all guys to get on Twitter. And uh, I'm excited to hear more of your insight, uh, you know, behind uh, way above the character limit on, tw on Twitter, hopefully. So, um, so this is just a conclusion. So basically in post cardiac arrest patients with shock after acute myocardial infarction, targeting MAP between 80 and 100 during the first 36 hours is associated with lower troponin values. And it really suggests, I really like the wording and even earlier, right before the conclusion, the author said that, you know, the data should be considered hypothesis generating. So, um, and so I think it's a great study for post hoc analysis and I'm uh, looking forward to uh, discuss it with everyone. Thanks, Lior. That was well presented. I'm just going to just highlight a couple of things. Can you go back to, to table one? Sure. There's a couple, a couple of questions or thoughts that I had while, while going through the, the study. Table one basically showed that, that I'll, I'll mention it while you're looking for it, it showed the, uh, the baseline characteristics and they were quite well matched between the, uh, the, two, the two groups, which, is, which was nice considering it was pooled from you know, a couple of studies. Um, the other thing is in, in table two, if you can go on, is really the question here is really was there improvement in diastolic coronary perfusion, which, you know, the graph and the figure seems to show. But one of the things that, that could potentially contaminate that would be the TIMI flow uh, of the culprit vessel post-PCI. And here you see like 93% and 95%, 85% of the vessels um, had potentially a normal flow after the, after the PCI of the culprit vessel. But if you, if you, so you can think, well, you know, the, all the vessels were getting normal coronary flow. But what was interesting is if you actually look complete revascularization, it was not complete in the majority of patients. Like, but 40% of patients in each group weren't com completely revascularized. So there's, there's a, a lot of thought that this diastolic coronary perfusion pressure may play a, a, an important role in patients who have already been fully revascularized, as well as those who are not yet completely revascularized, not just in the territory of interest, but maybe in the other territories as well. Um, that's just a couple of thoughts that I had. And one of the things that, uh, that uh, you mentioned a couple of times in the study was that it was really driven by the, the anterior STEMI with the LAD PCI. So my question is, is can this really be um, can kind of um, generalized to other, like a post a CERC PCI, you know, or, or an arrhythmic rest from a CERC STEMI? Or 
are really talking about the kind of LAD anterior territory STEMIs, or is it just because the anterior territory, anterior territory STEMIs is the majority of the patients that we're seeing the effect most in them? Um, those are a couple of my thoughts to, to start with. I just open up for the group. What does that, what does, uh, what do other people think about this? Hi, everybody. It's Gurmeet. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Dr. Amut, thank you so much for being so gracious with your uh, late night time during a weekday and, and, and joining us uh, here in Canada. We're, uh, we're very appreciative of your, of your generous time. I have a question for you, but before I do that, Michael, I just want to comment on some interesting insight that you had. People forget about diastolic perfusion pressure. And diastolic perfusion pressure contributes to what? It contributes... Um, to flow, right? And, and, and sometimes uh, the, it, it's a subtle thing and we always, uh, you know, some people talk about their systolic blood pressures, but that's why I think it's important that this study looked at the mean arterial pressure, right? Um, because that's also going to compensate for those patients who have some degree of distributive shock that's accompanying their cardiogenic shock and they get very, very uh, they can be very hypotensive in, with their diastolic pressure and they're not perfusing well, even though they, everybody thinks, yeah, just lower your systolic blood pressure goal. So I, I think that's an important point. Dr. Amud, I had, the question that I had for you is, do you see this as having any influence in the practice uh, in your institution or, uh, or with colleagues around Europe? Has this changed people's goals and targets? Um, well, thank you for your comment, of course. Um, personally, in my institution, uh, the MAP target after cardiac arrest in shock patients is nowadays uh, above uh, 80 millimeters of mercury. So actually, we already changed our practice. Of course, in the paper, as was uh, correctly stated by uh, Lior, uh, we wrote that the data are hypothesis generating. But to be honest, I really doubt whether it's feasible to do, for instance, an outcome trial with this setup because the inclusion of patients is really tough. These are shock patients. Uh, you have to include them in an emergency setting. It's, uh, it's not as easy as it seems. So we indeed wrote in the paper that this hypothesis generating, but I really doubt whether it's feasible to do an outcome trial and generate better data. Now, uh, what we try to do now is to figure out the mechanism why increasing diastolic blood pressure would actually decrease infarct size. And what we want to do now um, to, to support the suggestion that really increasing diastolic blood pressure uh, reduces infarct size is um, to measure uh, coronary flow directly in the cat lab in shock patients with a STEMI and then to uh, randomize them between a low and a high MAP target to wait for 20 minutes and to remeasure coronary flow in these patients and then to bring them to the ICU and to uh, of course keep the, uh, ran the randomization targets uh, as mentioned and then to remeasure coronary flow in culprit and non-culprit vessels um, after 24 hours because indeed uh, as was stated by Michael, um, the fact that 40% uh, of the patients did not get complete revesc might have influenced our results. But of course, after the publication of culprit shock, I think this is uh, common practice uh, almost in every cat lab uh, around the world. But uh, in summary, what we want to do is we want to elucidate the pathophysiological mechanism in order to support uh, people uh, and to convince people to go for higher MAP goals in these patients. Well, that's very, very interesting. Do you think there's a, a dysregulation in coronary perfusion during uh, cardiogenic shock that's, uh, that's unique to the myocardium uh, in the shock situation? Well, the way I look at a, a freshly infarcted patient is that you have the necrotic core and you have the border zone. And if you look at MRI data in non-shocked patients with large anterior AMI, then it's approximately a 50-50 thing. So 50% is necrotic core and 
is prone to be salvaged. And I think what you can do is not only to uh, improve coronary perfusion with um, increasing diastolic blood pressure, but what you can also do is that if you look histologically at the border zone, then these cells are swollen um, and they compress uh, the capillaries. And in my opinion, it might be important that you have a higher hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries just to resist uh, this compression. On the other hand, uh, increasing coronary flow might also uh, promote faster washout of microtrombi in the microcirculation and in this way uh, improve coronary perfusion uh, without just the effect of increasing diastolic blood pressure. So I think pathophysiologically many mechanisms are potentially involved. Thank you very much. Uh, it sounds like you're treating the uh, infarct zone like brain penumbra yeah. in a stroke. Exactly. Can I just point out one of the interesting things that, you, that I noticed was that you used the word shock and not cardiogenic shock. Um, you really talked about shock. Now, we presume that these patients primarily had cardiogenic shock, but you also kind of alluded to that there may be a distributive component. Do you think there's a role for a, a similar type of the study? I, I'm, I'm guessing you didn't have a pulmonary artery, arterial catheter information for these patients, but do you think there's a role potentially for measuring the degree of distributive shock in these patients? Because those distributive shock patients or ones that have a, a amount of more systemic inflammatory response may have differential response to pressors, maybe than the, the ones with cardiogenic shock without distributive shock. Any thoughts about that? Well, that's a very good question. And I think, um, first of all, uh, Many shock trials are actually uh, um, a mix of many things. If you, for instance, look at Gopert shock or, you, or you look at the balloon pump trials, then more than 50% of the patients are actually resuscitated and intubated. So they get, um, they get sedatives, uh, they get hypothermia, they get um, very fluctuating uh, CO2 levels, uh, they got sepsis because of pneumonia. And I think, uh, to be honest, in every shock trial, uh, there was a very important portion of patients with distributive shock. Um, it's also very tough uh, to make a clear definition of cardiogenic shock in a post-cardiac arrest patient, because if you look at the definitions that were applied in culprit shock or in the shock 2 trial, then there are always three criteria. First is blood pressure. Of course, that's very straightforward. The second is a reduction of cardiac index. But of course, if you use TTM 33, then there was a reduction of cardiac index and bradycardia in almost every patient. And the third component, um, that's even more difficult, is related to end organ perfusion. But of course, these patients are intubated, so you cannot use consciousness. These patients always have lactate, so you cannot use lactate. And they have cold diuresis when they are cooled uh, with TTM 33. So you, actually you cannot even use these criteria, but it's very tough to define cardiogenic shock uh, in a post-cardiac arrest population. But to answer your uh, first comment, uh, we actually, we, we, we love PA catheters and we had PA catheters in uh, every patient randomized to the interventional group of the neuroprotect trial. But of course, what you can expect is that you have a reduction of cardiac output and of SVO2 in the first 12 hours of ICU stay. Whether this is related to a reduction of um, really the intrinsic um, contractility of the heart or whether it's related to TTM strategies or to fluctuating CO2 levels, it's impossible to def to um, to know. Thank you. I, I, uh, another question is the trope change was, which is the primary outcome, was statistically significant, but I'm not sure how clinically significant it is, just from my perspective, because it seems to be um, the area under the curve is not a usual way we think of the troponin change. Just comment on that. Is that a is that a clinically significant uh, result? Yeah. Um, well, what we know is that there was a direct relationship between peak troponins in AMI patients 
and uh, hard clinical events uh, in lo during long-term follow-up. But of course, um, cardiac MRI is the golden standard uh, mm -hmm. to, um, to discuss this topic. Mm -hmm. And um, what you can say with cardiac MRI is that every 5% reduction of the AMI size results in a 20% reduction of clinical event rates after two years in terms of death and in terms of uh, admissions for heart failure. And what we had is actually a 37% reduction of the area under the curve, but it's impossible uh, to say how this relates to um, the percentage of reduction of infarct size on cardiac MRI. Okay, thank you. Are, are there any other questions? Yeah, you uh, mentioned that almost all of them had PA catheters, so you obviously measure cardiac output. You, I look at the paper, I don't see the reports on the cardiac outputs, because they also got more dobutamine in the higher patients. So could their benefit have been because you actually got better perfusion rather than just the pressure? And I don't mean perfusion because of the pressure, I mean because of the other drugs. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we published in uh, 2015 15 in a resuscitation a paper uh, comparing thick cardiac output measurements with thermodilution cardiac output measurements, so continuous thermodilution using the PA catheter in patients with pyroprotic hypothermia at 33 degrees. And actually it turned out that there was absolutely no um, good correlation between the thick measurements and the thermodilution measurements. And this makes a lot of sense because if you have a cooling catheter in the inferior vena cava, then it gives a lot of thermal noise. And the thermal signal that is generated by a continuous PA catheter is actually 0.04 uh, degrees of Celsius. You use Celsius or Fahrenheit in Canada? So mostly, Celsius, mostly Celsius, yeah. Celsius. So actually the, the thermal signal is very, very small. And if you g generate a lot of noise with the cooling catheter, then it's impossible um, to measure accurately uh, cardiac output with continuous thermodilution. Uh, well, that's, that's a good point, but my suggestion to you, you probably shouldn't be using the continuous. First of all, the other one's much cheaper. You get a delay with the continuous and really you would get the real information with just the regular bolus ones. Uh, so what about mixed venous? You must have that data then. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of data on... Uh, I, could, I could share the data from the supplement. I'll just do that. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll just, uh... so, here it is. Okay. So um, maybe go a little bit higher. Yes. So um, as you can see, this is a rather typical profile of a post-cardiac arrest patient uh, during ICU stay. What you should know is that these are data only from the interventional group of the NeuroProtect trial. So in these patients, SVO2 was targeted between 65 and 75 percent and mean arterial pressure was above uh, 85 millimeters of mercury. So the reason why we wanted to monitor and target SVO2 is that we were very much afraid that only giving alpha-1 stimulating agents, norepinephrine, would actually increase LV afterloads, reduce LV stroke volume, and decrease brain perfusion. Um, so this is not the typical profile of a routine post-cardiac arrest patient without SVO2 targeting. Because in this patient, without SVO2 targeting, you see a clear drop of SVO2 during the first 12 hours of ICU stay that recovers uh, during the next 12 hours. So actually what we showed in NeuroProtect is that you have the typical drop of brain oxygenation during the first 12 hours of ICU stay that was shown in our historical cohort that was shown in the control group of NeuroProtect, but that was not shown uh, in the interventional group of NeuroProtect. And we think the fact that we used more dobutamine and the fact that we targeted SVO2 is the reason why we could show in NeuroProtect that there is indeed an increase in brain perfusion and oxygenation during the first 12 hours of ICU stay that was not present in the GOMA-CARE trial they did not target SVO2 um, 
And we think that only giving alpha-1 stimulating agents actually imposes the damaged LV to too much afterload. And this is the reason why they did not see an increase of brain perfusion in coma care. Thank you. Any follow-up questions? I have uh, one more question to ask uh, the audience. Um, has this study and, and or this discussion convinced anyone here that, that this patient population should be treated to map a higher MAP target? Well, I just have a question for um, Dr. Sure. Amlu with regards sure. to that. I just, you know, in line with that, how do you balance on one side that these were two negative trials that showed no difference in what matters most to the patient? You know, if you tell them their troponin was lower, they won't care. They want to have a good CPC score and good neurological recovery. So how do you balance that taking data from two trials that were negative for a very important patient-centered outcome led to data that's definitely positive in terms of the troponin curve, but, you know, we don't really have a hard outcome, I guess. Like, how do you balance that at the bedside for, to make individual decisions? Well, um, first of all, I think there was no evidence at all for 65 millimeters of mercury target. We just adapt this from sepsis based on the unlikely hypothesis that the complex out-of-hospital cardiac arrest patients is similar to sepsis. And as you probably know, also in sepsis, there are, there are not so much data to support any MAP target. You've got sepsis PAM comparing um, 65 with 85 millimeters of mercury. And this was a negative trial. Besides the fact that patients randomized to the high MAP target in sepsis had better renal perfusion when they had hypertension uh, before their sepsis. So, um, I think, well, there was no evidence for a 65 millimeters of mercury target, but there is some evidence now, at least, that you can increase brain perfusion and that you can maybe reduce infarct size with uh, 85 millimeters of mercury. Now, the reason why NeuroProtect was a negative trial, uh, besides the fact that it's underpowered, so it were only 112 patients, so it should be considered as a pilot trial, is also the fact that um, brain MRI, which was the primary endpoint in NeuroProtect, actually is a very, very bad surrogate for CPC 1 and 2. So uh, there were not so much data supporting um, uh, brain MRI as the primary endpoint of my trial, but we thought, well, you can, as, you can count the ischemic voxels and this should anyhow correlate with outcome. But if we perform this analysis, then it turned out that the area under the curve to predict CPC 1 and 2 is only 0.6. So uh, if your brain MRI is, uh, shows very much damage, then the patient will 100% die. But a lot of patients don't, do not recover um, they have postanoxic encephalopathy with a perfectly normal diffusion weighted brain MRI. So uh, one of the reasons why NeuroProtect was a negative trial, besides the fact it's underpowered, is that uh, brain MRI is not a good surrogate for outcome. And the third reason, and it's probably one of the most important reasons, is that we were an all-commerce trial. So we included shockable and non-shockable, uh, irrespective of the delay and irrespective of the time to rusk. And actually, to be honest, this was just stupid because uh, we included 25% of the patients that, um, that were beyond salvation. Uh, that the first hit in the pre-hospital period was uh, just too extensive uh, to allow an effect of any ICU intervention. So I think what we need in uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest that's uh, a larger trial uh, with more pragmatic uh, inclusion criteria and randomizing uh, patients between low and MAP, high MAP targets and to see what turns out. Great, thank you so much. We have, uh, we're a little bit over the time, but if anyone has a burning question, please feel free to, to ask now. Otherwise, Could he, um, sorry, uh, it just, uh, it's basically uh, Dr. Magner's question actually. Um, you know, in fact, it is um, a field target. Uh, we know this is area under the curve or pressure effect, or was it maybe just a fusion and increase?
to put a um, and then the second I think deck arrest patient Toxic injury has been completed, so necessarily perfusing, uh, uh, increasing perfusion, not significantly change outcomes. You know, definitely ensure that there's perfusion. I work to increase swelling, increase edema. Kind of syndrome. Oh, I'm so sorry. We, 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 had a, we had a hard time here. We had a hard time here. Oh, really? Yeah. You want to try one more time? Or well, maybe just write it in the chat so then I can. Uh, I can As well, yeah. Yeah. Well, we're, well, we're waiting to get the question from the chat. Uh, uh, anyone? I other, yeah, I have another comment. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, looking, I mean, the, the, a crucial point is there's absolutely no difference in the mortality in 180 days. It's not even a trend. It's actually the other way. So there's a disconnect between any clinical signs of benefit versus just a troponin signal. So is that really a valid signal? Is it a better... Um, it, well, no, the total area wouldn't matter, but, uh, but it's striking. There's just not a trend. And if you tried to power a study on this, you would need, uh, based on that data, like you couldn't do it. Well, I think there were some trends, but of course it's underpowered. But uh, the What's most important trend is that 80% of these patients dies due to postanoxic encephalopathy. So even if they are in shock, they do not die from shock. It's only a few times per year that you can, that you lose a post cardiac arrest patient in refractory shock that you don't want to save. So if you put them on ECMO or Impala or in any form of mechanical support that you're used to, it's very unlikely that you are not able uh, to let the patient survive for a few days. So the majority of these patients dies due to postonoxic encephalopathy. And indeed, it, probably for these patients, it doesn't matter uh, what the infarct size is. So it, it's not a determinant of survival. Yeah, so I guess that suggests then that what you really need to do is uh, you know, have a non-shock, more salvageable population and then do the comparison in that population uh, and remove sort of the complex part of the brain death. Mm -hmm. Studying okay. this in non-shock patients is, is a little bit more complicated because- They can do shock, but shock that are not, that have a better uh, CNS prognosis. But how often do you see a uh, cardiogenic shock with a STEMI that is not resuscitated uh, before hospital admission. In, in my hospital, it's only a few times per year that, I've, that I have a very large freshly infarcted LAD who is not yet resuscitated. It's also the problem with the inclusion of the danger shock. Uh, I know, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Danger shock is Impella versus EABP with non-resuscitated shock uh, in Denmark and in Germany. And they are very struggling with the inclusion. They're already including for seven years and they're only halfway the trial now. Now, what I, I'm getting at is like, for example, if you look at the shock trial, and what is it, 30, 40% actually had a pre-hospital arrest. Their survival is, is certainly uh, still, there's a good survival group. So you can identify a group that after they're resuscitated, you know, their CNS prognosis is potentially salvageable. Mm -hmm. So that would be an interesting group to determine whether you're actually exactly. improving cardiac function. That's I what I meant. You have to look at the gray zone. So these are patients who got BLS. Yeah. Short time to rusk. Right, so exactly. The brain is salvageable. That's the one that will yeah. determine the prognosis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. All right. I think we're going to wrap it up now. Just in the interest of time, we like to really try to keep it to our 30 or 35 minutes. Thank you so much. That was a very enlightening discussion. Definitely, as Lior mistakenly but correctly pointed out in the chat, that it was a really uh, enlightening discussion, one of the best ones we've had so far. So thank you so much. We wish you best best of luck thank in you. your <laughs> best of luck in your continued work, and we hope uh, to host you again in the future with one of one of one of your next big studies that you put out there. Okay. See you guys. Take thank care. You so much. Good evening. Thanks.